For those of you joining us online this morning, welcome and good morning. It is so great to have you join us this morning. If you are new here, we would love to meet and connect with you. Um, you can do this in two ways. You can go to frontlinegr.com slash new, or if you're joining this morning, right to the left of these barn doors is a next step area. We would love for you to come and meet us there, get to connect with you, and we have a gift for you. Maybe this isn't your first time here. Maybe you've been here a few weeks. Maybe you've been here for a while, and you're looking for a new way to get connected and plugged here at Frontline. Maybe it's to join a small group, maybe a serving team, maybe it is even to get baptized. There are several ways that you can get plugged in and to find out more information and how to sign up for those, head to frontlinegr.com slash next. Speaking of connecting, if you've been tracking with us, you know that 20, in 2021, we're doing a thing called the Year of Serving, where each month we are coming alongside one of our partners in a deeper way to serve them. For the month of February, we're partnering with our Care Point in Ukro. Two ways that we're partnering with them is through a virtual, uh, virtual tour and for a letter writing party where we're writing letters to the kids that we sponsor. Two ways that you can register and find more information about that is one, there's a booth in the back today. Um, you can head back there and find out more information. Also head to frontlinegr.com slash sent. One last thing I have for you this morning is Wednesday nights at eight o'clock is beyond the weekend. Beyond the Weekend is a time where our Zero Collective pastors and special guests get together to take Sunday morning's content into a deeper way. So join us on Wednesdays at 8 p.m. for that. There's also a kids version. It's super fun, hosted by me, on Thursdays at 6.30, and we'd love to have your kiddos join us for that. Before we get ready to worship this morning, let's pause a moment and posture our hearts in prayer to him. Will you pray with me? Dear Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this fresh start today. Lord, first and foremost, I ask that you come, that you come and fill this place, fill our homes this morning, fill this building this morning, fill our hearts with your presence. Allow our hearts to be open to you and what you have in store for today. Be with David's message, Lord, and then it take root and produce action in our lives. Lord, thank you. We are so blessed to be able to serve and worship you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and stay in church as we sing this morning. Let's welcome him into this place. All of the earth makes straight a high path for the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. Go back to sin, wake up the saints, let every nation shout of your fame. Jesus is coming.
section one more time. God, we wait.
on this journey I get lost in my mistakes It looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength And my story isn't over My story's just begun If fail you won't define me Cause that's what my father does If fail you won't define me Cause that's what my father does Shame at the door, city welcome anymore. Ooh, you're in the father's house. Life was not the end game, the journey's way. Just one in my heart. And the story isn't over If the story isn't good The failure's never final When the father's in Let's sing that again The failure's never final Sing us together, prodigals come home. The prodigals come home. The helpless find hope. Love is on the move when the father's in the room. The prison doors be wide. The dead come to life. Love is on the move when the father's in the room. We sing it. The miracles take place. morning. What a morning. What an incredible gift it is to be able to worship in the Father's house. One of the ways we get to worship is by the giving of his tithes and our offerings. So this morning, I just want to say thank you for your faithfulness and continuing to support the ministry here at Frontline and beyond these walls. Each, each Sunday, I hope you are blessed by the team of volunteers who serve here in worship arts up here and back there um, that help lead us in worship. But what you might not know is that from time to time, I get to see firsthand not only what your gifts do um, and allow us to be able to do each and every week, 
but I've been able to see the direct impact of your gifts and how they help different people, even on our own teams. And so seeing the blessing from both the side of the giver and the side of the receiver has just been an awesome thing to watch and be part of. So this morning uh, on your screen, you'll see there are multiple ways to give. And I wanna just encourage you um, to check those out. And uh, I wanna just pray for our offering this morning, but I also want to pray for David as he gets ready to, to come and uh, teach us more about what we've been learning in Revelation. So if you bow your heads with me, Father, we just thank you for this house, this sacred place that we can come and we can worship. It's not about just worshiping here, it's about worshiping wherever we are. But man, what a freedom we have to be able to enter into a place like this to just worship. What a gift that is. So God, as we, um, we pray for David as he brings us the word, we pray God that you would just instill in him a heart that longs after you that he'd be able to communicate and articulate well what you have for him. I thank you too just for the gifts and the abilities that we have to be able to give back a portion of, of what you've entrusted to us. And so I pray for um, these gifts too. I pray that you would multiply them in the ways that you see fit. We love you, God, and we thank you so much for just an incredible morning to worship. We pray these things in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Well, hey, good morning, everybody in the room. Good to see you. Good morning, everybody watching online. So happy that you are here and joining with us this morning. I just absolutely love that bumper video that plays right before. I mean, don't you wish that was your alarm clock in the morning? I think your day would just be better from the start. Man, I'm so excited about what we're jumping into today. We're in Revelation chapter 3. Um, we're continuing on in this series. We've got a couple weeks left, but unpacking these different letters that Jesus wrote to the churches. And so, I, don't you love this too? My whole life, I've wanted to ride this thing. Like, ever since we installed it, I want to ride it on its way up. So, here's where we're at. 549 BC, there's two kingdoms at war. The kingdom of the chiefs and the kingdom of the buccaneers. One's led by King Tom, the other one's King Pat. Are you tracking yet? Come on, okay, let me change it a little bit. Well, let's get historically accurate. 549 BC, the map looks like this. There's the empire of the Persians. Persian empire, it's growing. Like Tom Brady's looking to add more rings. King of Persia's looking to add more territory. And so Lydia becomes on the map. Lydia is an important spot because think about the Black Sea and the Mediterranean Sea and all of the routes that would be available for trade. So what the king of Persia does is he comes against the king of Lydia. They're at war with one another. And the war, it's like a hard and it's a difficult war, but a war that's not that fruitful. You know what I'm talking about? It's a war that actually resulted in a stalemate. And the tide was turning and the season was changing. And so both sides, neither one of them was winning. It, it just became a game of losses. And so both of them cut their losses. And what they both assumed was, we'll take a break and we'll resume the war in the spring. They were headed into winter time. And so the king of Lydia led his army back to Sardis, which is the focus of our time today. His army is headed back to Sardis to retreat for the winter. And then King Cyrus of Persia is heading, is taking his army back to Persia. But here's the thing, King Cyrus went, wait a minute, I could have an advantage here. The army that I'm opposing right now doesn't anticipate me. They think we're paused. They think there's a stalemate. They think we're not doing anything. And so he waited until the army of the Lydians dispersed. And then King Cyrus led the Persians to attack. And so they fled. The army of the Lydians fled back into Sardis. And Sardis was this unbelievable city and it had a huge advantage. But when King Cyrus showed up, they actually surrounded the city, which looked like this. It was actually positioned on top of this mountain. 
Think about the high ground that you have. Think about the safety. Sardis was a wealthy city. It was the capital. It was where the king resided. It was wealthy. It was powerful. It was safe. They had walls that were around the city. They had the high ground. It became near impossible for an opposing army to scale these cliffs to actually breach into the city without just being destroyed and obliterated by the army of Sardis. And so what the king of Persia did is he laid siege around the city. It's when they set up camp, they don't let anything in or anything out, anyone in or anyone out. And so the only hope of Sardis was waiting on their allies to come rescue them, but their allies were tied up. They couldn't get there. So the siege is taking place, and it's basically a waiting game, right? It's winter. They're kind of bundling down. They're getting ready. Well, here's where the story turns, and I just think this is hysterical. But there was a a soldier who was guarding. He was a part of the Lydian army. He's in Sardis. He's guarding the wall, and you can only imagine the scene, right? He's goofing around, or he's playing with one of his buddies, and his helmet falls off. Now, imagine you're like up top, like on this mountain, and your helmet blows off. And, and let's, say, let's call him Scooter. That just seems like a fitting name. Scooter, we all have a Scooter in our lives where he was goofing around, he messed up, and all of a sudden, Scooter's going to get in trouble, and so is everybody else around him. So his helmet falls down the side of the cliff, and he looks down, and, and what's he do? He's got to go get his helmet. Or he's going to be in trouble with who? His boss, his commander. The, the army, the king, whatever it is. So he goes, I, I, I can't be caught without my helmet. So what Scooter does is he jumps over the wall and he scales partly down this mountainside in a, way, in a way that nobody else had. And especially the army, the opposing army, the Persians had no idea how to get up. And one of them happened to be watching. And he watched as Scooter jumped down the wall, followed this kind of secret path that nobody else saw before. He retrieved his helmet. He climbed back up. And what he thought was he got away with it. He thought that nobody had seen it. He was good. Everything was good. The commander didn't know nothing. They were good. And here's what happened. The Persian soldier that watched it happen went straight to the king. And he said, I know how to get in. And that night, the king led the entire Persian army up the hill. They went through that exact route. And when they came up to the wall, you know what they found? Nobody was even guarding it. And they walked right into the city and they surprised everyone. What's so funny is Sardis had this reputation. There's a reputation for being alive, reputation for being safe, reputation for being well, reputation for being, you know, luxurious and entertained. I mean, their whole city, their whole culture was a lot like the American culture. I mean, every church that we've studied in Revelation, this one I think is the closest to what many of us understand as our reality. It was the birthplace of modern money. It was easy to make money. I mean, there was easy money. That stigma really started in Sardis. There was a life of luxury. Entertainment was constant. I mean, these people didn't have a cure in the world, and they weren't really oppressed because they were so safe. And because of their lack of oppression, because of their lack of attacks, because of, because of the way of life that they had grown accustomed to, they just let their defenses down. They let their guards down. They had this reputation for being big and powerful and elite, but the reality actually underneath it was much different. You know, it's funny, they fooled everybody, including themselves. And the Persian army comes in and they breach the wall and they take over. And it's not too long after that Lydia becomes part of Persia. And history is in the making. You know what's so funny about Sardis is it didn't just happen once. It happened twice. 650 years later, Jesus shows up in a vision to the apostle Paul or to the apostle John. And John is on this island, he's by himself, and Jesus reveals himself, and he says, I want you to write some letters to some churches, seven letters to seven different churches, and the church that he's writing to today is the church in Sardis. Here's what he says. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1, to the angel of the church in Sardis write, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. The seven spirits of God and the seven stars. This is Jesus saying, I have everything. 
I know everything, I am everything, I am the fullness of God, and then I also have the ability to give the fullness to the churches. This is who I am. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. You know what's so interesting about the city and the culture of Sardis is it was extraordinarily immoral. Sexually speaking, financially speaking, economically speaking. I mean, when you're not oppressed, it kind of anything goes. And so that's kind of this culture and this life that they grew accustomed to. So Jesus is saying, hey, to the church in Sardis, I know your deeds. I see your deeds. I see what's underneath the surface, even if others don't. You have a reputation for everything being good and well, but deep down, I know you're not, you're not struggling. You're dead. Dead people can't do much about their circumstances. But Jesus looks at him and he says, you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. So the city had the reputation for centuries of being alive and well, but it was vulnerable. It was weak. It was dead. The church in Sardis had a reputation for being alive and well and busy, but in reality, it was dead. I want to ask us the same question today. And the question goes like this, is the condition of your soul better or worse than it appears to be? Is the condition of your soul, your heart, your relationship with God, is the actual condition better or worse than it appears to be? I think some of us it's better. I think most of us it's worse. I think a lot of us coming in today, man, the stories I've even heard this week and that's been a part of my own life, marriages are falling apart, depression and anxiety are running rampant, addictions that are just owning people, people feeling empty and lonely and hopeless. Some are questioning God's existence. Others are questioning God's goodness. Some are just walking and struggling with sexuality. They're feeling guilt and shame and numb. And if that's you, I just want you to hear what, whether you're in person or whether you're watching online, we are happy that you you are here because Jesus has something for you. Jesus has something for you. The letter that he's writing, Sardis, doesn't stop there. But you know what's funny? I, I have a mentor in my life. I was talking to him about a year and a half, two years ago. We sat down and, and he played this game with me. You, you know the game where you know the answer to a question, but the other person doesn't know you're playing the game? I was the other person. So he sits down and he says, David, how are you doing? And I went, I'm doing pretty good. You know, life's pretty good. I'm happy. Superficial. I kept it superficial. And he said, David, what's the best thing that you bring your ministry? I go, how do you answer that without sounding prideful? I was like, I, I don't know. He said, what, what's the best thing you bring your family? Oh, okay. That changes a little bit. What, what's the best thing that you bring your friendships? in your relationships, and I start struggling, and I'm trying to articulate, and I'm fumbling, and he's just sitting there, and he's just smiling at me. And you know the, the moment when, like, you realize, I should just ask you what the answer is? And I look at him, and I said, Chris, what, what is the best thing that I bring anything? He said, I'm so glad you asked. He said this. He said, David, the best thing you have to offer your family, the best thing you have to offer your job, your wife, your son, your ministry contact, the best thing that you have to offer anybody and anything is this. It's a well-ordered soul. It's exactly what Jesus was writing about to the church in Sardis. He's not saying the best thing you bring is your reputation. He's saying the best thing that you bring is your reality, and when your reality is a well-ordered soul, it's like a well-oiled machine. Like when the relationship between you and God is good, it's healthy, it's overflowing, it's abundant, that you experience him, that you hear from him, that you follow him, that you're led by him. What Chris said to me is, David, the best thing you have to offer is a well-ordered soul. And then conviction fell afterwards. And I thought to the seasons and years and context of which I didn't have anything of value to add if this is what value is. Can any of you relate do any of you understand what that's like? Revelation 3, verse 2, here's what Jesus says after. He says, wake up. Wake up. Take some notes. Write down, wake up. 
You know what's really funny about a dead person? Can you wake up somebody who's dead? Jesus says, wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished. Such an important word that we need to hear today. What Jesus is doing in our world and what Jesus is doing in your world at this point is unfinished. It's not over. It's not dead. It's not done, and there's not a period. There's a comma. I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. What have they received? What have they heard? They've heard of the person of Jesus who died on a cross, who died to sin, who died to shame, who died to guilt, who died to all of it, who died and then resurrected. He defeated it. He's saying, go back to the message that you heard about Jesus. What was once dead, God actually brought back to life through the person of Jesus. Well, how do I get that? How do I go back to that? He, the last word, it's been in almost every letter we've unpacked. The word is what? Say it with me. Repent. Repent. It's a church word, but it has a simple meaning. It just means turn. Turn. Stop this direction and start moving this direction. The invitation and the opportunity comes after a realization, I am dead. My relationship with God is hurting. It is struggling. It is distant. It is broken. Here's what Jesus says. Wake up. Stop. Turn. Repent, hold fast, cling to the thing that you once heard, the thing that is still true, the good news of Jesus. You know, it's funny, the city of Sardis, the things that they were actually known for, the things that they built their lives on actually contributed to their death. Aspirations of wealth, aspirations of safety, Aspirations of independence. All these pillars, these foundations that so many of us in our culture, in our day, today, many of us, if we're honest, seek after and build towards these very things the church in Sardis did and it led to their demise. That's part of the good news that Jesus came to offer. These things that you're building your life on are inherently unstable. They can't do for you and provide for you what you're looking for. Because you're chasing them and building them, it's killing you. Money, wealth, power, independence, entertainment, luxury, safety. Can the same be true of us? I love this quote, theologian named William Barclay, he writes this. He says, the church of Sardis was at peace, but it was the peace of the dead. I can't help but think, how many different seasons of my life has, have I mistaken or mistook peace for death? brokenness in my relationship with God. Everything else was good. Everything else was fine. Everything else was stable. But I mistook that peace for true peace. Jesus even describes himself other places in scripture. He says he's the prince of peace. There's two different kinds of peace here. One is peace because there lacks life. The other one is peace, which is life. William Barclay says the church of Sardis was at peace, but it was peace of the dead. It was the peace that we don't want, that we don't want to move towards. It's the peace we want to run from. Revelation 3, verse 3, B, it says this, but if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. What's so interesting about this is it's the letter that Jesus writes is a warning to the church in Sardis. And it's so close to home, it's their history. They know that it was during the night that the Persian army stormed their walls and took over and they weren't ready. Jesus is writing to them ahead of time as if he's saying this, hey, the enemy is coming. 
The enemy is coming. There's a day you don't anticipate. There's a day you're not ready for. There's a day that, that you've avoided or discredited or, or not even thought about. There's a day that's coming in which you will be overtaken, but I'm gonna tell you something else. There's a day that I'm gonna come like a thief in the night. And I'm inviting you right now. I'm giving you the opportunity right now to turn of your ways, to follow me. But if you don't, I'm still going to come. But it won't be to rescue you. It'll be to condemn you. It's a harsh warning. Throughout the Gospels, throughout the Bible, there's this dueling reality of grace and truth. What Jesus is offering the church of Sardis is consistent with Jesus and God's character all throughout Scripture. He offers grace upon grace upon grace upon grace upon grace and warns of an impending judgment someday down the road. And he offers grace, and he offers grace, and he offers grace. And at a certain point, if you don't take the grace, you fall under judgment. So in his kindness, in his goodness, in his love, Jesus is offering grace and truth. I'm coming. I'm coming. Be ready. Turn. Repent. I want to ask you a very personal question. And it's a hard one for me to answer too. The question is this, what's dead in your life right now? Notice I didn't ask, is there anything dead in your life? What's dead in your life right now? Maybe it's a relationship between a spouse or a parent a child, a sibling, a friend. Maybe it's an addiction that it just owns you. Maybe it's a wound, something that happened to you, something that hurt you deeply that you just haven't recovered from. Maybe it's a dream that has died. Maybe it's your relationship with God. Maybe you can't get pregnant. Maybe you're struggling with depression, anxiety, fear, and it's crippling. Maybe it's sin, temptation, obsessions. Maybe it's a diagnosis. What is dead? in your life right now. Jordan McDonald uh, is an author. I think he's in his 80s now. I got to hear him speak not too long ago. At this conference, he, he said something that was so fascinating to me. And it's actually shaped how I see you know, my future and my growth and development and also my relationship with God. He says, what I've noticed is in, in every season, my sin and my temptations have changed. He said, what I once struggled with as a 20-something-year-old man and then a 30-something-year-old man is not what I struggled with as a 40-something-year-old and a 50-something-year-old and then a 60 and a 70 and an 80. He said, my temptations and my sins, they all changed. They adapted like an organism as I adapted and grew. And the question I want to ask you, is that happening too? Is what you're struggling with today something that you haven't encountered before? Or is it something that was, that was seeded decades ago and is now rearing its head years or decades later? I just love that. Do you know what our temptation is when we acknowledge the death in our life? It's to quit. It's to give up. Or it's to give in and stop fighting. It's to accept it. It's to tolerate it. It's to settle for death because, I mean, how many of you maybe have said this statement? Once the love is gone, there's no getting it back. Once the dream dies, it can no longer be revived. Once the damage is done, there is no repairing it. Once the diagnosis is delivered, there is no going back. I told you I have good news for you today if that's you. Jesus says something different. 
is good news for all of us. It says this, Revelation 3, verse 4. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. Soiled their clothes uh, is talking about the pagan culture in that time required you to have perfect, pure, white garments as you approach these fake gods. So Jesus is directly referencing them. He's directly talking about them and then acknowledging the stupidity of this. Because watch this. There's a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They walk with me. So they haven't soiled their clothes. They look good on the outside, but they're dead on the inside. Jesus turns it and he says, those who walk with me are alive on the inside. It's not about the Sunday best that so many of us bring to church. It's about the soul that we bring to our relationship with our creator. He says, they will walk with me. You know what discipleship means? To walk with. Jesus says, my disciples, my people, will walk with me. And he says, them, it's them who are dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Here's what Jesus is saying. I don't care what your life looks like on the outside. I care about the condition of your soul. And then he takes it one step further. He says, even, even though your soul may feel dead, even, even though parts of your heart may be broken, that you may look at and say, it's just done, it's over, it's beyond repair, it's beyond fix. It's, it, it's not just dead, it's like dead, dead. Like stinky, decayed, dried out, broken. There is no chance here. And what Jesus says is, I, I'm incredible. You don't even understand that I, I am the same God that can breathe life into Adam and Eve to bring life out of nothing. I'm the same God that can do that and also that can bring life out of something that is dead, that is so far gone, that's so decayed, that's so broken, that's so disgusting. Jesus says, even that is not too much for me. I want to show you this picture. This has been a really significant picture for me this week. Um, all of you know, or I hope all of you know, um, Brian shared some of his diagnosis um, just over the last couple of weeks and just heading back into chemotherapy now for the first time and what that's been like. And so he, he and I come in on Saturdays and we pray together. And so it, he and I have been walking through that. But, but then I, I have another lane and it's, it's David's personal life and the wheels came off this week. Somebody that I love dearly attempted suicide this week. And I got the news and I heard it. And you know what I'm talking about where it's like, it just, it doesn't feel real. It feels fake. It feels superficial. And then it hits you. And here's what I thought of. It felt like it just transported me to here. In a valley by myself, it's dead, it's dry, it's broken. It doesn't seem like there's hope, it just seems like there's death. A lot of you are here right now. A lot of you know this place. A lot of you have spent a lot of time in the valley. And God in his goodness selected one of his prophets named Ezekiel. He said, Ezekiel, I want to show you something. I want to speak something to you. I want to reveal something about me and my character, but about how I love and take care of my people. I'm going to transport you here. And Ezekiel describes it, and this is what he says. This is Ezekiel chapter 37. Verse 11, then he said to me, God speaking to Ezekiel, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. Time out. He's not talking about these bones are, are, are the world. God is saying these bones are my church. Remember the letter that he wrote, not just to Sardis, but to us, was his church, was his people. God is saying, I'm looking at my people and they are dead. They're dead. 
They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. It's not just the body that had just died that Jesus can come back and do quick CPR and bring it back. They're saying we, we have been dead for so long that decay has happened, that rot has happened, that deterioration has happened. There is no turning back. We are cut off. Therefore, here's what God says, prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, my people talking to you. I'm gonna open up your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. I will restore you. I will bring you back to life. I will do what you can't do for yourself. I will do what only I can do. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, you will know that I am God when I take dead things in your life and bring them back to life. That's what God declares to his people, to us. I will put my spirit in you, my breath, my ruah, the same breath that God spoke and he breathed into Adam and Eve at the dawn of creation. God says the things that are dead and broken in your life, I will breathe into them and bring them back to life and you will live. And I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. Here's how I wanna to close today. There is deadness in every one of our lives. There's deadness in our hearts. There's deadness in our behaviors. There's deadness in our relationships. Not one of us walked in today perfect and whole and pure. All of us are carrying something. And so what a great opportunity we have right now to go before our heavenly father and actually acknowledge the deadness and then ask him to bring it back to life. I didn't talk to the band about this, but I should have. I wanna invite you, if you need to come up here and pray and worship and repent, if you need to bring your spouse or your child or your parent, if, whatever it is that you need to do, whatever is dead in your life, maybe you don't even have a relationship with Jesus. And you say, today is the day, now is the time I'm gonna do it. I, I am dead, I bring nothing and I want life. I'm gonna invite you to come up as the band leads us in worship. Let's pray. Father, we come to you dead, broken, hurting, lost, lonely, dark. Father, we bring so much pain, so much grossness, so much filth. Father, so many of us, we just need you. We just need you. Father, stir, use your spirit in this place right now. Raise up an army just like you did with Ezekiel in the Valley of the Dry Bones. Bring things back to life right now. Bring this church back to life right now. Bring the church in the United States back to life. Bring the church around the world back to life right now. Father, breathe your spirit, your ruah inside. Change people, Father. Bring them back from death to life. Do what only you can do. Father, we come before you right now with our deadness, with our brokenness, with our pain, with our sin and our addiction. And we trust you through the person of Jesus to do what only you can do. And that is to bring us back to life. All God's people said together. Let's respond, let's stand together. Let's sing it. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind away? It was my tomb. Till I met
And all God's people said together, amen. amen. So happy you were here today. I think our heavenly father is so happy that you were here today to hear the good news that he has for us. If you're brand new, if you're joining for the first time, welcome again. Um, FrontlineGR.com slash new is one of the best ways for us to get to know you, how to serve you. If you're ready for a next step, I mean, FrontlineGR.com slash next or the area right outside is great. The last invitation I have for you is beyond the weekend. Um, we can only do so much from this spot right here on a Sunday, Wednesday nights at uh, eight o'clock and then Thursdays for kids at 6.30, Facebook Live. Uh, we're gonna go deeper. We're gonna unpack what it looks like for the Church of Sardis and for us today. So don't miss it. Don't, what a great opportunity to learn more. Um, as we leave today, I wanna to leave you with a benediction. And so a tradition here is if, if you wanna extend your hands just as a posture of reception and re receive the benediction or blessing that I believe God has for us today. Brothers and sisters of Frontline Church, despite the brokenness and the pain and the death that many of us carried in this morning, may you walk out today alive and awake and with a soul that is on fire for Jesus. Receive his breath, his ruah, his spirit, and step back into the broken and dead parts as one who has been revived in Jesus. All God's people together said, Amen. Thank you for coming, and we will see you next week.